Chapter 23, we're skipping 22. Yeah, 22, well, we're 22 with the virus. No, what's 22? Wait, we did 21 and then you posted 23 today. Yeah. What's 22 then? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Oh, that's from guy. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'd like to get familiar with that. They're getting there kind of, they're relatively, at least in this part of the country, the world is relatively in the serious ones. You get down where it's nice and tropical and moist and humid and stuff. <laughs> All right, so what's a parasite? Someone who kind of feeds off of a host and finds them? Something, yeah, that can't survive what? Alone. By itself, in, in one particular shape or form, right? Parasitic infection. So we're talking about protozoans and helminthic parasites exist worldwide. These things are everywhere. One thing you guys are going to realize you're going to notice in here is the U.S. is kind of lacking behind the rest of the world in dealing with parasites. And they're becoming more and more important. Occur among people in rural, underdeveloped, and overcrowded places. In general, does that mean we're not overcrowded here, right? We're not underdeveloped? Well, we're missing a couple of restaurants, but I'll catch them. <laughs> and, but see, you still come down with a parasitic infection here. Yes. Yes, so it's more common than what we're talking about here. Emerging is a serious threat in developed nation, developing nations. So this is becoming more and more of an issue. And especially if climate change changes, if things get warmer in some places, particularly here and more humid, what's going to happen? Then we'll start developing. You're going to have mosquitoes that are, have been eradicated, starting to move back. You're going to have them move into places that didn't used to be. Parasitic infections often involve several hosts. You need to know these two, so I underline them. And I, I may not in yours if you put it off the same. Definitive host is where the adult or sexually reproductive parasite. That's a host in which the parasite can actually reproduce. And that's called the definitive host. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the intermediate host is a host in which you have the immature or non-reproductive. A lot of these are going to be cysts and things like that that you get inside. And some of these parasites we'll talk about, you're not supposed to be the host. And so you'll become sort of an intermediate host because they'll insist inside of you. Like my little brother. <laughs> parasites can affect humans in one of three ways. Ingestion. Vector-borne transmission, which is usually going to be by what? Insects, right? And direct contact. And that's going to be some of the ones we'll talk about. All right. I don't memorize this, but this is just different uh, ways through some transmission. A camp amoeba is going to be through the eye. Anybody here wear contacts? Have you ever heard what they ever say about washing your contacts? Most people use disposable ones down, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Anybody use re reusable ones? Well, like 14 14 but when you don't wash them and put them in a thing and yeah. put them back in your eye, do you? Yeah. Yeah. You do or not? Yeah, you have to like change the solution. The solution? Like every like two days. Yeah. And then even then, like I wash it my fingers. And, and back in the past when they were glass and they were disposable, you had a lot of people, a lot more people would come down with these things because they would get in the water, they'd be in the water supply. Mm -hmm. So you've got Megalaria, we'll talk about that one. Ascaris, Cyclosporidius, Cyclospora, Mechanococcus, and Amoeba. Giardia, Poxoplasmosis. You have a few sexually contact ones. Giardia and Amoeba. Trichomotus is a big one. Uh, contact penetration, Nicator, Schistosomes. We'll go through these in a minute. These are some of the big ones that are coming up here now. Are going to be the vector borne, Trichomotus, Plasmodia, Procrophy, Plasmodia. And there's another trophy. So we'll go through as far as we can get on these. All right. Vectors are animals that carry microbial pathogens. You should know this from chapter one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Arthropods are common vectors. Why? Not like a little caterpillar. Because they're able to move and then they're. Caterpillars can move around. And they're not going to chase it down or anything, but <laughs> what is it about arthropods? What are arthropods? <laughs> it's basically insects, things like, like that. flies. Anything that will fly. Insects, 
Yeah, oh. And they used like in, that they like blood. Yeah, a lot of them. Not all of them. Yeah. In fact, I shouldn't say caterpillars. A lot of those are actually larval stages. Some of these things. Some arthropods are biological vectors, and they can serve as hosts for the pathogen they transmit. So they can be a definitive host too. Not only can they pass it on, it can actually survive inside of them. And that's a bigger problem because it makes it harder to what? It makes prevention and control a little bit tougher. All right. Disease vectors belong to two classes, Insecta and Arachnidia. What are those? Anybody know? Insects and spiders. Spiders and insects, yeah. Up. All right, now I'll talk to you about a few of these things. I'll let you guys catch up here. What's a protozoan? I know it's a unicellular eukaryote. It says up there on the thing. Mm -hmm. Unicellular means is what? One cell. One cell. You can be asexual or sexual reproduction. Asexual. Either or. To be either or. Don't be mm -hmm. careful on that. They're not bacteria. Mm -hmm. Protozoans that enter the body via ingestion have two morphological forms. This you guys need to know too. So I'm going to go through and kind of check off what you really need to know for sure. Tropozoites are the feeding and reproducing stage that lives in the host. Okay? The cyst form is an infective form that survives in the environment and undergoes insistent when ingested, developing into tropozoites. So what's usually going to happen in the life cycle, let's say it's one that's in the water, you drink the water, right? You drink the cyst, the cyst gets inside of your body, then what does it do? It becomes the tropozoite. It's going to convert, it's going to change into a tropozoite, in which case it's going to be in the reproductive stage. And when it gets ready to leave the host, it's going to re do what? It's usually going to form a cyst again. Now, like I said, some of these you get inside of you and they, they're the wrong organisms. They'll start crawling around inside you trying to find their way out. And those are a lot of the ones that do a lot of the damage. And if they finally can't find their way out, what do they do a lot of the time? They'll insist in your tissue somewhere where they think they're supposed to be in the sort of <coughs> right now. Okay. Undergo system adjusted, developing into a triple toy. Exist. Tropozoites undergo a system before leaving the house. Already one of them. Undergoes. So what's a good question to ask? What is. What are the, what, uh, in terms of protozoan parasites, what life cycle stage are you going to find in the real ground? Cyst or the trouble the way? Cyst first. Usually you can be the cyst. You gotta be a little careful. It's fun to know that. All right. Parasites classified group classically grouped by their mode of locomotion. Ciliates, amoeba, flagellate, and apicomplexes. I can't say that word. I don't know what that one is. I would have left it out, but it's an important group. Okay, these are the ciliates. Protozoans that have cilia. On the tropozoite stage, so is this the reproductive stage or the non-reproductive stage? Reproductive. Palatinium coli is the only, this is a nice easy one for the ciliates, is the only ciliate known to cause disease in humans. So this one's nice and easy. Commonly found in the tract of humans. And almost all of these are going to be what? These protozoans. Not all of them, but a lot of them are going to be what? Fecal oral route, ingestion. Okay. The the name of species containing cysts. The trophozoite attaches the mucosa of the feeling lining of the intestine, and infections are generally what? Asymptomatic in adults. So, could any of us in here have this? Yes. Yes. How did we make the news last week? Is any of you realize? What were the two ways we made the news in El Paso last week? Anybody notice the national news? Which one? I don't remember what it was. The one about the, the airline, Southwest Airline, you remember oh, that? Yeah, the lady the who named her kid ABC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the one that just, uh, there's actually, they've done a story that it's like 2,000 kids in New York. 2,000 or 4,000. 
was done there. <laughs> um, the other one was they were talking about the water and about how we're going to start re-injecting treated sewage water. Oh, that came out today, yeah. yeah. So apparently we have like a drought or something like that? Well, we're just running out of water. It's just, and then and, and, um, as population increases and, and um, precipitation has gone down, down, and down. Now, we already have those four tertiary treatment plants that injected into the full cell. So you're already drinking your pee and poop right now, which is very delicious. Yeah, I was wondering what the difference is now. So. This one apparently is going to be a closed loop system, so it's not even going to go back into the water. It's going to just go right, I mean, it's not going to go back into the bolson to get diluted out. It's just going to go right into the water system. It's, 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 yeah, I don't drink water. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's the stuff that comes out of their super clean. I mean, they test it constantly. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, why is it that any of I never actually learned about this one. Occurs in those with poor health, persistent diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weight loss, severe infection may produce dysentery, and ulceration of the intestinal mucosa. So some of these guys need to need to start chewing away in there. Uh, I'm going to go to the, I'll go to some of the diagnostics on some of these. This one I won't. Just know what this one is. All right. Prevention relies on personal hygiene and proper water sanitation. Now here's a question. Does chlorination kill everything no. in our water supply? Do you think we're relatively safe because everything is chlorinated? What do you guys think? I think it kills a good amount, but not everything. High percentage? Study yes or no. Do you think a lot of some of these things may be able to get through the chlorinating stage? There are a couple of them that really can. There was a big outbreak in Wisconsin. We get to that. We'll talk about it. All right. This is a funner, funner one. This is a more interesting one. Amoeba, protozoa with no truly defined shape. Anybody see the movie The Blob? Either the old one or the new one? Who's seen it? I think it's, yeah, I think it's like a long time ago. Is that Steve McQueen in it? You see the new one or the old one? That's the new one. The other one's like 1960 something. Nobody seen it? The block. You guys never saw it's the block. Old, it's the old one where they, they kill it with the fire extinguisher? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, using the little thing to test. Like, that. Nope, I don't think that's that one. I don't think it's like a hot needle to see it. Nope. Nope, no, that's not, no, that's not, no. Oh, no, that's, that's, that's the thing from the outer space. That's the new version of it. Oh, you think it's the other one? Wait from the sci fi movies. <laughs> the, uh, the only thing is the, the, the blob was basically just a giant what? Just a giant amoeba. They just go around engulfing things, they swallow them up, and they break them down. Right? Move and acquire food through the use of their pseudopods. That's how they move, and that's how they grab onto things. So if you saw that, that's what like, grab it and pull it in. Okay. I'm going to start showing that lab. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. All right, found in water sources throughout the water. Throughout the water. Throughout the world. You cause disease. So most of us, when you get in the water, you're going to ingest what? Oh. If you go to Elton Butte, you go to somewhere. Elton Butte is probably better than some because it's what? It's an artificial lake and it comes from a lot of runoff. You go to warmer water lakes, I guarantee you, you've ingested some amoeba. All right. This is the one that's bad. If the amoeba hits the lake, though, this is one of the ones you need to know. Carried asymptomatically, but it just attracts a lot of humans. Carries predominate in less developed countries. No animal reservoir for this. Does it need an animal reservoir, though? No. Most of these are free living, right? So you don't have to worry about animal reservoirs. AKA, are you ever going to get rid of them? No. No. Infection most commonly occurs by drinking contaminated water. I want to bring a couple things on this. Excisment occurs in the small intestines, and the trophozoites migrate to the large intestine. Now, this I think is one of the ones that actually has to go through the digestive system. Actually, some of them actually have to go through the acidic environment of your stomach to start excisation of it. Wow. Because remember, these are parasites. So that means they've done what evolutionarily now. 
Have they evolved as free living organisms? No, so they've evolved next to us, right? All right. Three types of amoebiasis can result from infection. Luminal amoebiasis, which is just asymptomatic infections in healthy individuals. You get it, you've got it for a while, you might become a parent carrier, you may get rid of it. Invasive of amoebic dysentery causes severe diarrhea. What's colitis? What's that? Appendicitis. Inflammation of the appendix. That would be the, and ulceration of the intestinal mucosa. This can vary in severity from relatively minor to life-threatening or fatal. Okay. Invasive extra-intestinal hemobiasis is the tropozoites in the blood that are carried throughout the body. This is the really bad one. Okay. And immediate dysentery, invasive extra-intestinal hemobiasis can both be fatal. Now this is one of the ones they worry about what? Where do you see it? Where can you get it from? Water, right? Mm -hmm. So is it like those people that go out on vacation now to like those beaches and stuff? Okay. Water? Yeah, could, well not swimming. This is probably, well, it could be not this particular one. This is more of fresh water. And then probably like go to third world, so like missionaries probably do? Oh yeah, they have a big problem with this. But I'll tell you what they write down. These things are pretty tough. They're not easy to kill with disinfectants. That's what I'm talking about. A lot of these amoebas and things are pretty, pretty hard. And antimicrobials won't work on them? They, they do. They have, you have antiparasitics. Oh, okay. And I'm not going to go into a bunch of them because it would take you. You could have a whole two weeks on the antiparasitics. But we have UTEP who brought down a new faculty, potential faculty member, to be a parasitologist. And they took her over to a really nice restaurant and bought us. Oh, God. <laughs> And they did not drink any water, but they did have what? Alcohol. Some alcohol. Yes. They had some other bottled water, but what else did they have in their drink? Ice. Ice. And the ice can does not kill you. And she actually came down with it and needed to hit the She was pretty funny. And it's even the parasitologist, too. She took the job. <laughs> As you say, there's a lot of research around. But she was okay. She just got um, she got a mild case of the invasive disease. When I mean mild, though, I mean it doesn't kill you. It doesn't mean you're going to be sick. All right, this is what they look like right here. That's just a cyst. So how are you going to look for most of these guys? How are you going to diagnose them? Still sample Fecal material. How are you going to do that? And what? Mirrored on its life. <laughs> You can. You do what's got you. You'll have to do that. You do what's called a fecal float. So you put it in there. And you kind of pull it down a little bit, and most of the most of the uh, cysts will float to the surface. Yeah. You do something like that with the horses. Oh, do yeah. So you look at the yeah, guy. That's exactly what you do. All right. So diagnosed based on identification of the cysts or trophozoites in stool sample for intestinal biopsy. Not going to go into that too much. Asymptomatic infections are treated with paramycin. Symptomatic amoebiasis. <coughs> I'm not going to worry about. It. Because uh, there's so many of these guys, you wouldn't you would take forever. Mm -hmm. Oral rehydration therapy coupled with drug therapy, if you have a mild case of it. And again, the main part here is maintaining clean water with high levels of water. <laughs> Got to make sure it's properly chlorinated. They have had a couple places where the chlorine levels have dropped, and they've had some of these parasitic diseases skyrocket. All right, acanthamoeba and maglaria cause rare and usually fatal brain infections. Common inhabitants of natural and, what did I say? Artificial. What's an artificial? Sewage yeah, plant. Sewage plant. Elvin an artificial lake, but another artificial water system could be what? Just our water system right here, right? I mean, you can see about that. Individuals who wash their contact lenses with tap water can become infected. Oh. And this is what happened when contact lenses came out at the beginning of what I was talking about. When they were the glass ones and people were washing this water, you started getting some of the canthamoeba infections. That's why they say not to use water. <coughs> tap water. You're supposed to use that solution, right? Is that what they're also worried about when they have the, um, like that nasal? The so Manny Pond, that's the next sucker coming up, and that's the one that really is going to make your day miserable. So I'll throw this one in a minute. 
Okay, get the mediators to cut scrapes with the conjunctivo or inhalation. Keratinitis occurs in the trophozoites and made the eye. That's the one they really worry about. And you can get amoebic encephalitis. What is encephalitis? Swelling of your brain? Brain. Okay. <laughs> okay. Altered mental state, neurological defects, and what? Death. Death. Nigleria infection occurs when swimmers inhale contaminated water. This is Nigleria Fowler. Okay. You get amoebic meningeal encephalitis, may result, causes hemorrhaging, coma, and I don't know why they say usually death, because as far as I know, every single case this is a fail. Now they think they may have found a drug that may treat it, but you've got to get it before, almost before you know you're sick. This is the brain-eating amoeba when you talk about. You've heard about in the news. Now, where do you <coughs> get this sucker? <subject? coughs> So yeah, where do you get it normally? Where are most people catching it? But these things like to live kind of in the shallow edges of lakes and rivers, and they kind of settle in the, in the silt down there. And, the, and, the, and you get in there, you swim around, and you pick it up. And it's more prevalent when it's hot. And what else might it become more prevalent? Standing water. Standing water, but even think about what else though. What could increase it? And the same body of water, Aside from activity, what could increase the chance of catching that? Would it be like in um, in India where they bathe and, and do everything in the in in their yeah, on their coast? That could be in almost any of these. But what do you think could really increase your chance of infection here with this one? Do they really say hot summer months if it's been dry? What's going to happen to the water? It's going to drop down, and that's when it becomes more and more of a problem. Why? Because it's just that you get you're getting water getting down closer to the bottom and you stir oh. things up and you can't turn it All right. A few other places you can get it, they say never to use tap water for those neti pots now. What's a neti pot? It's like near the sinus. Put sinuses and you clean it in there now. Because they it's, it's had one infection with somebody using a neti pot. Who was it? England. There was also do you think how did it get into the water? There was a parish in Louisiana that had their water treatment was not uh, stringent enough, and they actually had Nigleria Fowler in their municipal water supply. So they said if you went to this parish, you did not use them drink tap water for the neti pots, and you did not shower them in the water. Because any way you get one of those up in your nose, it just starts to eat its way up through in your brain. And it's done deal. So um, I have, I'm a little confused. Hmm. I guess I gotta switch my way of thinking. Why is it only through your eyes and your nose? Why drinking it isn't doing it or showering with it? Because these, these two particular ones are not gonna get through the probably the digestive tract. Oh, duh. Uh, okay. So they're gonna get in there. Now Larry Fowler really likes to, to, to go after the, the mucus membrane that's in, because what's right behind your skull? In your nose, your brain. So it just eats its way up into Okay. Yeah, these, yeah, I don't think either one of these would survive through the intestine, through the digestive tract. Okay. Okay. Diagnosis and indication of trouble by clinical specimens. The problem is by the time you diagnose it, it's usually what? Too late. Too late. Too late. <laughs> Characterized to be treated with anti inflammatory drugs, amoebic encephalitis, and ketoconic, <coughs> amoebic uh, meningitis encephalitis. Right now, they're trying to use an amphotericin B, but it just doesn't do much for power. They've got a new drug that's supposed to maybe work. But they, the, the last kid who had it, they, he was in Florida. I think the drug was in North Carolina. And by the time they flew him up there, it was too late. Brain infections often diagnosed. Whoop, what did I just say? Too late for treatment. All right. Again, prevention is going to be what? It would be tough since organisms are environmentally hardy. Swim pools and devices that are used that use water should be what? Routinely cleaned. If you're going to use a neti pot, what do they want you to use now? Water or boiling. Either boiled water, either, either bottled water or boiling. Because boiling can be killed these things. Fortunately. Alright. That's it for that one. Flagellates. Protozoans that possess at least one flagellum. Never to raise it up to determine the species. This is a big one here for you guys. 
to Panasoma Cruzi, which causes Chavez disease. I've heard of that. Endemic in Central and South America and Mexico now, and it's also moved into where? Texas. Southwest. They found it in Brownsville. They found it in bugs outside of Phoenix. And a group of researchers from UTEP just got it outside of Van Horn. And there's been a couple cases of it already. Opossum, see, just stay away from armadillo, people. Opossum and armadillo are the primary reservoir. And transmission occurs through the bite of insects in the genus <coughs> Tritoma. Oh, is that why everybody's going crazy about those kissing bugs? Yeah. Oh. Kissing bugs into the jubit feed preferentially on blood vessels near the lips. So what happens, let me just open this up on the other one. But let's go through this, I'll tell you how it's a big problem. So what happens is the trypanosome becomes infected in the hindgut of the uh, kissing bug. The infected trypanosomes are deposited in the feces of a bite. They don't inject it. They actually poop it out while they're feeding. Okay? You, what do you do at night if something's irritating you? Scratching. You scratch. So what you end up doing is your scratching introduces the infected group of those into the blood. You're the one that actually infects yourself with them. Okay? So trypanosomes travel the blood. Uh, what about this? Transform into non flagellate form or like that. non flagellate trypanosomes multiply by the vision. Again, I'm not going to worry about that. But what's going to happen is some of the flagellated cells, after they, they convert back over, infect other body cells, becoming non flagellated in the process. The problem is these things sometimes infect the heart. Okay? And then what's going to happen? Another rejuvenate is going to come in and do what? Take a blood meal and it's going to reinfect. So I don't want you to know the whole life cycle of this one. It's really pretty straightforward. Get to the hind gut, develops, they feed on you, it goes through two different stages, they get reinfected. I'd rather I can spend more time on the, the disease itself. So the Chagas disease progresses to four stages. The acute, which is Chagas Loma, generalized stage, an asymptomatic chronic stage, and a symptomatic stage characterized by congestive heart failure following formation of the system. This causes about, this causes heart failure about 25% of the patients infected with it. And the only treatment for it is what? Uh, heart transplant? Heart transplant. So what is it affecting the valves? Is that why a heart transplant? Muscle and everywhere. You get them all over the place. Most people are going to be what? A few stage, you get a little, you can, this is when you can actually kind of treat it. What is it? stage, the asymptomatic chronic stage. What's yeah. a chagomus? That's just the, 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 the general the acute stage of it. It's kind of what you, I forgot what the actual symptoms are for it. I'll look them up. Okay. Parasite induced heart disease is the leading cause of what? Is a leading cause of death in what? Latin America. Latin America. Now, does that mean if you go down to Brazil, Argentina, somewhere like that, and you have to worry about it too much? It's out of your nice hotel room? Oh, no. Why not? Because they have it clean. They clean, and so there's not a lot of kissing bugs. Huh? Nice resort? <laughs> Actually, you don't have to worry about it. The one they really have trouble with is the, 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 the rejuvenated bug likes to live in thatched roofs. So don't go stay one of the cool ones that have a thatched roof. What's that? The little, like the, the leaves that make the roof on top. Oh. Of the wall, the they okay. like to live in there, then they crawl down their body. Um, so let me go through the whole thing. So how are you gonna how are you gonna look for this? What they look like inside of a blood test? Gross. There are currently no drugs for it right now. <gasps> you can treat it, and I know you do the scariest part of the thing. So identification of the troubled mastic goats or the antigens the clinical specimens is diagnosed. This is how you're gonna find out they have it. Another way they do it is xenodiagnosis. This is kind of interesting. What you guys know. It's an altered diagnosis method. They take an uninfected rejuvenate, 
Do they know they've grown their lab and doesn't have the parasite in it? They actually put it on the patient's arm and they put a glass over it in a little container and they tape it on. And they allow the bug to feed. And after the bug is fed, the presence of parasite in the hind end of the bug after four weeks indicates what? Infection. So this is kind of an old school way to do it before they came up with molecular techniques. That is one hell of a wait time. Yeah, well that's the biggest mm -hmm. problem with it in the end. Fortunately, the infection is pretty slow going. <laughs> but the problem is back in the past, it was like, yeah, you got it. You got about a one in four chance of needing a heart transplant in about 25 years. So kind of, kind of, not so much. Now, early shock disease can be treated. Is it at all? I don't even know if you're familiar with that new one. If you catch it early, like you said, you got four weeks, you got to worry about has it insisted anywhere. The scariest part about this, late stage disease can be treated and you have to have a heart transplant. Uh -oh. Well, what's that prevention involves? Oh. <laughs> prevention only five of the scariest part about this now is 80% of the new infections in Brazil are through the blood supply because there's no effective detection for it and it's not tested for it. And it's not tested for in the U.S. in the blood supply. And if it's in Brownsville and it's in Van Horn and it's outside of Phoenix. Okay, one question. If, um, is this like a zoonotic disease where um, the person gets infected and cannot pass it to right. another person? Except through the well, that's where you have that weird thing where we're with it. I guess what they're saying now, if you can get infected anyway through it, like through a blood transfusion, I guess technically they're taking that out of the zoonotic category. Okay. I wouldn't, though. Right, but that's, uh, nobody, not like I can say anything, right? But no, under normal circumstances, yes. Okay. Alright, the next one is Trypanosoma brucei. This causes African sleeping sickness. Huh? The insect vector is the tsetse fly. Great animals are as reservoir host for these things. Two variants. T. brucei gambesi, which is going to be what? West African, and T. rhodesiense, which is going to be Eastern and Southern African. They love to separate those two out. One usually causes more serious disease. Where do you think you catch this one? Africa. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Even if it's you might infect the DZ fly. All right. Anyway. What's the, the African problem with this is this guy likes to actually live in faster. Most flies like to live where? Garbage. But kind of calm water, right? The DZ fly actually likes to live in faster running water. So. Problem is anywhere you've got fast running water, you're going to have what? Species flies. Anywhere you've got flies, you can have what? This is a huge problem. Now this is one of the ones they found. They're trying to find some natural um, anti-parasitic drugs that work on it. So what does the African sleeping sickness do? You're just like in a coma, or what? You're real sleepy. <laughs> so I can get that, I need more sleep. No, hold on, it's not that. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's way worse than it's now. Oh, God. All right. So, again, non effective trypanosome matures in an effective form within the salivary gland of the TC fly. TC fly injection while feeding. Trypanosome bacteria via the blood and lymph of the systems. Trypanosome replicate by binary fission and body fluids, including the blood, lymph, and where? Spinal. Spinal okay. Thinner progeny remain infected in the body. Shorter, thicker ones are what? Ineffective. Keep you fly. Now it's going to go up. And the problem, I don't know what happened there, is one of the big problems is right here. Where'd it go? Spinal fluid. This can actually go up and infect the central nervous system. Mm. Trumpenosomes are ingested by the TT fly during a blood meal and the cycle continues. It's when this happens when you have a problem. Okay. So the life cycle is in several ways. Brucei matures in the salivary gland of the TT fly, not the hind gut. TT fly is directly injected versus what? How do you get infected? If I had a quick short answer question on trypanosoma cruzi, how do you become infected? With the, the poop of the... 
you actually get some effect with it, right? PT fly just leaves you, I mean PT fly. The rejuvenate bug just leaves you a little present, right? You push it in. Brisei live live outside the host cells. Alright. Right here, let's get down. African sleeping sickness has three stages and left untreated. Fat of the flight mite becomes a lesion of dead tissue. Parasites of the blood trigger fever, lymph node swelling, and headaches. From within, it's almost too late. And then, what's the meningoencephalitis? Of the back. Pretty much everything, right? Oh. Right? <coughs> Death can occur within a few months of disease onset. If you do not catch this early and treat it, this is almost all, as far as I know, it's always fatal. It just may take longer than a few months. All infections characterized by cyclical waves of parasitemia, which means what? With parasitemia, we went over viremia, we went over bacteremia, we went over septicemia. Parasites we in your par blood. Parasites in the blood. Okay? The host immune system is unable to clear these infections. And it's one of the things that a lot of parasites do this, and this is a problem with them, is parasites are con What does the immune system go after in, in an infectious agent, like a bacterium? It goes after your immune system, and it goes first for your... your so your immune system go after? Yeah. But what? What do they look for? What does it look for? What are what are the antigenic determinants? The epitopes. Antigenic the determinants. Hmm? The binding sites. The binding sites, which are usually be little glycoproteins most of the time. The receptors, something on the surface, right? They don't change. The problem with a lot of these parasites, in particular this one, it is constantly changing those surface glycoproteins. Wow. So it's constantly hiding from them. So even if you develop an immune response against it, what happens? It hides. It's going to change them and it's going to be worthless. <laughs> so you can't lice them open or anything like that? It won't, it won't lice No, because they just change them. A lot of times they kind of fall off too. It's constantly changing them. So it's pretty tricky the way it works. Now, if they're doing it because it's thinking about it. How does it do it then? It's just part of it. It's something that just goes through these constant Cycles? changing of that outside of the world. Wow, weird. Some of these parents that you can find out are pretty, pretty sneaky. Yeah. All right. Presence of trouble masticates in clinical specimens. We're going to close the end. African sleeping sickness is what? 100%. 100% it fatal if it's done properly. Early stage in treated with phenidine and serenamine. They're trying to find some natural um, plants so they can use. Central nervous system infections are treated with lazaprol. Never heard of that one. Clearing TC fly habit introduces disease causes. So they try and go out and kill off all the people. Mm -hmm. But those nets help, right? Yeah. The mosquito nets. Release of sterile male TT flies has helped eradicate flies in some reason. This is a new file control strategy they're doing. They're trying with malaria. Take the male flies and you do what? Sterilize them. You sterilize them. Then you go out and release them into the mosquitoes. They breed with the female flies, but the male flies are sterile, so you don't get any eggs. But um, like, isn't that one like one reason we can't eradicate mosquitoes is because it would mess up our ecosystem? Actually, that used to be on the case. A lot of people I've actually looked at two newer articles, and there are some people out there who pretty much said, "Nah, you I don't give a shit." <laughs> that would be wonderful. The, most things there's there's one orchid that is only pollinated, I think, by mosquitoes, and well, you just have to give up that orchid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But, yeah, they used to be a big thing, mess up the food web, and they've done a lot of studies on it now, and they're pretty much like me. That's correct. You can get rid of them, get rid of them. Yeah. First of all, sex aside, netting and long clothing help reduce Oh, things. there you go. All right. Lychmania, what did I say about Lychmania already? I don't remember. Okay. I know I talked about it before. All right. How's the lychmaniasis? <laughs> that was not helpful. Endemic in parts of the tropics and subtropics, the Middle East in particular. It's kind of deserty, so I don't know why they don't do that. <laughs> Wild domestic dogs and small rodents are common hosts. So again, are you going to get rid of this? No. Animal reservoir. Lysmeni has two different developmental stages. Let me just open this up. 
a mastigotes, which multiply in the host macrophages and monocytes. And these are two of your primary what? Uh, immune system defense. But what part of your defense? Mm -hmm. Your innate. Your innate immune response, the not specific one. So it actually gets inside of these guys. But also, these guys can also do what? Move around, right? Yeah. From mastigotes, develop extracellularity within the vector's gut. So this is going to be inside of who? Us. Oh, no, Us, that. Right mm -hmm. here. This is going to be where? In our testicles. Inside of the vector, which is going to be a sample. Oh. Okay, so again, you've got this right here. <laughs> you've got chromatics multiplied rapidly by my attrition in the sand fly. Chromatics are injected into the host. Macrophages, bagels, are just a parasite like you're supposed to. So what happens? Chromastigotes are transformed into amastigotes. Amastigotes are going to multiply by having an excision inside of the macrophage. And then do what? They're going to get out of the bloodstream. They can do two different things. They can go back and reinfect more macrophages, right? Also, the sand fly takes a meal of blood containing amastigotes and the life cycle continues. This is actually a pretty simple life cycle compared to some of them. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Yeah. The heart? Three clinical no. Okay, let's see. Cutaneous lysomoniasis or large painless skin ulcers oh. from the at the bite of the wound. Okay? okay. So they're crawling around there destroying the skin. Right? But an ulcer is what? Is that a little flaky thing? Mm, it's like ulceration is gonna be a little hole, right? Yeah. Mucocutaneous leishmaniasis is a skin lesion that enlarged to encompass mucous membranes in the mouth, nose, and soft palate. In visceral leishmaniasis, is when macrophages carry the parasite to the liver, the spleen, um, the bone marrow, and the lymph nodes. That's where it's messed up. Fatal in 95% of untreated cases. So it will visual. turn into that, or it's just a version? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Part, part of your body has to do some of your immune response. Okay. So if you get visceral isomenitis, you're in bad shape. So this is definitely like stages, like? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Well, not stages, it's different forms. Some people just get the cutaneous. They just get a, a lesion around where the bite was. Other people get that. Well, and that's the second one. We just said the muco. That's mucocutaneous isomenitis. That's way that worse than I was thinking. Huh? What? That's painless. Uh, painless? Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, yes, they don't really bother. They're just painless. You're serious? Yeah. It's just, they just get this weird thing. What does it say about visceral? Mm -hmm. I don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, these are just big lesions that get on there. So they're skin lesions. It's not the ulcerations. Is he going to die soon? The problem with this is what? What happens with some of these people? And this can't happen. Configuration is one of but you can't start blocking your airway because that's one of the big problems you can't get. And it can start getting into the soft palate of your mouth. Mm. It can't get into the it doesn't hurt. What was okay. the third one? Let me finish up with this last one right here. Okay. Identification is what? And they'll talk about the argument. Amastic goes to patient sample. Immunoassay can convert this. Fortunately, in most cases, leishmaniasis are going to be what? Kill with that treatment. That first one. They're going to heal on their own. Visceral lysomyces is treated with paramycin, sodium, what is it, still glucanate, and amphotericin B. Prevent limiting exposure to the reservoir and the vector. Okay, on that note, what did I say about this earlier about lysomyces? Do anybody remember? Well, where'd you go? It has become endemic in a small region just north of Dallas, Texas. What? This? Yep. Is it those uh, they damn armadillos? He was a big gardener. He came in. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Turns out he had uh, you, uh, he have visceral. He had a. He just had the visceral, but a pretty bad case of it. Not visceral, but close one. Um, turns out, yeah. <coughs> oh, well, I mean, I'm that. Okay. they think that because a lot of the military are coming back with it from the Middle East and oh. Afghanistan, they think that 
they, they, they not think there is a sand fly or a fly that lives in Central North Texas that can act as a reservoir host for it now. Wow. Which means it's what? Endemic now to it's Dallas. To <laughs> One more reason to stay out of Dallas. It's gigantic. All right, guys, so.